I want to talk about power relationship models. First of all, let me explain. When we work on the plot of a story, just the concept of a plot usually puts us in a linear, linear frame of thinking. The word is related to line. You think of something going on in a line. So when you look at the plot, you're looking at it in a linear fashion. It's sequential. Things happen along like a stream. It goes along in a line. And certain things are supposed to happen at certain points in the story. They're supposed to be the slow build to the climax, and at the climax near the th end, there's supposed to be some sort of transformation or resolution, and certain things are supposed to happen in the first act, and certain things are supposed to happen in the second and third acts. And this is all very linear thinking. Now, there are limitations to working on the plot in this way. Also, it's an amazing way of working on a story, but it isn't the only way. It's been my experience that critiquing, rewriting, seeing our stories in a linear way can be great for editing and not as good for creativity. When we're working on plot, we have an alternative. We can look at it in terms of a power relationship model. We writers would do well to develop a sense for power relationships. Okay, in the real world, what we have going on is a multitude of power relationships. So many that we can't grasp it immediately. We have to create, in our minds, we have to create simplified models of what is happening. The Book of Changes is, is a great way to gain a sense for the power relationship model. The great thing about a power relationship model is that you could it, only one could be powerful enough to serve an entire trilogy, to serve seven seasons of a story. I'll give you an example. The example I want to work with today, I'll give it to you. Okay, here is the power relationship model in its most simplified form. You have an ancient building, an ancient house made of beautiful stone, and it is consumed, it is overgrown with this vine, this one vine that is so thick and thorny. It, it covers the house. It makes it so that no one can enter the house. When people try to chop the vine down, it grows back, and no one can live in the house. And the thorny vine is so over overpowering, it's massive. If you were to measure the weight of this vine, it would weigh as much as three giant buildings itself. It's really a huge plant. You know, this is this is the most ancient building the people who live in that area know, and, and it's it's a very special building and they want to reclaim it. So you have all these different attempts to, to free the building of this vine that has taken over and has forced other inhabitants out. Nothing works. This, is, this vine is, has a durability and ability to grow in all different climates and all other plants in the area could die and it would still grow and it would last through 10 years of drought and fire, it's fire resistant. Everything is thwarted. Every attempt, this vine is like one of the most durable life forms imaginable. And one day a visitor arrives, a foreigner to that land, who the gardener, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> and uh, 
has a bottle and in the bottle is root poison and goes and finds it finds there's only takes a while for this foreigner to find it but finds one area where the dirt and this is such hard dirt but there's one area where the dirt can be removed just enough to expose a little bit of the root and pours this uh, poison on the root and it goes and destroys it it eats away at the root and eventually this overpowering vine dies and becomes brittle and does not grow back and all of a sudden it before it was flame retardant now fire can help to remove it and what I just gave you is not just a story. This is a power relationship model. We're really getting at the heart of what stories can be about. And especially when you look at, at old fables and uh, the stories of uh, Aesop's fables, and these, these aren't just stories. These are these are describing, they're not describing events so much as they're describing a system of power relationships. So let's look at this. You have the overpowering thing that, that gets a hold, gets a hold of, of, of something that we consider the most substantial part of, of the area, this ancient house where all these community events take place. It gets a hold of it and, and, it, and it's uh, at, one, at one way it's uh, sneaky with its little vines. It can get into places where people don't expect it will. And at other times it's, it's overpowering. It squeezes people out and they just they can't get rid of it. They try to chop it away one area and it grows in another and so what we're talking about are a very reduced amount of characters you have the vine is a character in in the power relationship you have the ancient house as a character you have the inhabitants they act they can be seen as one character so looking at a story in this sim most simplest of ways gives us a way to get control of our stories. And I'm not talking about getting in control of stories that we've already written. I'm not talking about the second or third draft of a story about, about making decisions to make it work better. I'm talking about getting in control of a story we have yet to create, about getting in control of it creatively. One thing that happens a lot is that there's something that happens to us in our real lives and we may be keeping it cool on the surface, do it, still doing what we need to do, but deep in our subconscious, our subconscious is in turmoil trying to understand what just happened. And our subconscious creates these power relationship models to understand the events that take place in reality. And so the ones that make the most sense, our subconscious holds on to. And th this, is, this is the pre-conscious period of when a story is getting made. And then it may surface. We may be working on a detective story, but we have, we have as the power relationship model a story that sounds like, you know, it's, it's more like a mythology. In general, these power relationship models are as simple as you can get. You cannot make the story any simpler without having to lose one of the characters. And usually, at most, it's like five characters. And I'm, when I say characters, I'm not talking about people. The house is a character. The inhabitants are a character. The, these are... These are Think of them as like organs in an organism. When you have an organism, it has a stomach, it has lungs, it has legs, it has blood system. The same is with these very simplified stories, simplified to a point that they're reduced to their most essential parts, can be used as wonderful 
creative guides in creating a new story. When you have in the back of your mind one of these stories, one of these power relationship models, it can inform, it helps generate all kinds of new ideas about where to take your story. So as an exercise, write from your own life. Don't, don't just, from your own life, don't write about what actually happened, but go ahead and consciously try to create these power relationship models that, that would help explain some of the things that happened in your life. And don't think of these as finished stories. Think of them as pre, as happening be before the story. We feel more freedom of creativity when we get in the habit of thinking of these power models as being behind stage. These are things that we don't need to present to anyone. These are our secret tools. This is, this is one of our secret ingredients. This is one of our secret guides. And for that reason, these power relationship models don't need to make any real sense. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you have a friend who is dying of cancer. And so you, you, your, your subconscious churns up power relationship model. And here's how it goes. There is an enchanted forest, so dense, so thick that nothing there, you know, it's so impenetrable. And one day a, a mouse from the real world is nibbling away by this most ancient of tangled, impossible to traverse forest. And just being a mouse accidentally wanders into it. And once this mouse is in the, the enchanted forest, being from the real world, the mouse is like a, a poison to the enchanted forest. The, 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 um, the real world is poisonous to the enchanted realm. And so the spirit of the forest wants to get rid, sees the poison infecting the forest and, and doesn't see the poison itself, but sees the effect on the forest. So it wants to get in there and take care of it. So the spirit sends in its army and the army goes in there with huge tools and all the power of machinery and they they start trying to get at this this terrible poison and in their minds they think that it must be a, a terrible huge thing to cause such damage and that's the big reason they can't find this little mouse and the little mouse every time it hears the clamor of the machinery it just runs down a branch and gets away and so eventually this ancient this ancient enchanted forest is getting destroyed for two reasons on one hand from the poison from the real world and on the other hand the the machinery that is trying to to get in there and and tear the poison out and uh I'll I'll leave it at that but you can see what this is is it is a very simple story, but it isn't just a story. It is a power relationship model. We can look at it not just in a linear sense of how, where it starts and, and what happens to the characters along the way and what is the outcome. We can look at it the way we would look at a, the insides of a clock. We could see each character and the way it fits with the other characters and what power each character has over the other characters and how each character succumbs to a certain power from the other characters and how they fit and and what what kind of tensions what what violence and destructions occur in in these relationships and what what uh, good things can happen due to the relationships and kind of the math of of what's going on about about how how the possibility of, of the way these different forces can interact with each other. And, and it's all about possibility. It's all about what could happen. And thinking of these very simple models does not 
take away the possibility of what can happen in the stories. This is the one of the wonderful things about creativity is when you reduce it, when you when you when you reduce it down, you open up the possibilities because when you look at these very simplified relationships, they become uh, what can happen the sky opens up of, of the different possibilities of the way this story could play out. Now the last power relationship model I gave you, you again, you could take this and you could use it for any kind of story. You could say, okay, the mouse is the executive at the law firm and the enchanted forest is, you know, or you could say the enchanted forest is the homeland the traveler hasn't visited for such a long time. Or you could say the enchanted forest is the brain of my friend who's dying of cancer and the mouse is the, the cancer and the, the uh, army of the spirit of the forest are the, the uh, hospital trying to remove that cancer. So I'm not just talking about creating parables or analogies or, or God forbid, symbolism. I'm, I'm talking about getting, learning more about what happens on the subconscious level before we put new stories to paper. It has to do with the way we as humans get a grip on our realities and understand them more. When, when, we, when we set out to create a new story, when, when we also take the time to come up with a power relationship model that we want to have working behind the scenes in that story, we can use that Whenever, whenever we get stuck with a story, whenever we get confused about, okay, we have this great story, but what, what, what's going to happen? We have a great beginning of a story, but where, where can it go? We have great parts of a story, but how do, how do we bridge the gaps between? If you have something like this, this is a great help because you, it gives you a great sense for what's going to happen. And it's also helpful to come up with power relationship models that are even simpler. That's one reason I love the Book of Changes. They have the, these aren't even stories, they're so simple. Okay, let's, let's try making up a, a couple of them right now. There are three friends sitting on a ledge. One is holding a kite. That is an example. What, what, what is in that? What, what is in that model I just gave you? Possibility. Tons of possibility. What if a storm is on the way and the one with the kite is the one that, that gets blown away and, and ends up swept away on a huge adventure? Those three same people make a lot of money one summer. One, one of them puts it in the bank. One of, it, one of them buries it behind his or her house, and the third goes out and hides it in the woods. Again, possibility. What could happen? What if there's another Great Depression and the banks all dissolve? Or what if, what if there's a, a terrible fire in, in that town and all and, and uh, everything's destroyed? So as an exercise, for a while, try it. Every, every day, try to come up with one of these new power relationship models. And they don't even need to be stories. They could be so small that it only involves maybe two characters and, and it describes the power relationship they have with each other, how they benefit each other, how the potential, the, what potential for destruction or, or well-being is inherent in those power relationships. Do you see how we're not looking at the plot in a linear way anymore? Now we're looking at it like an organism. Now we're looking at it like the machinery of a clock and, and, and how it plays out. We're paying attention to the interplay of the different power structures 
and we're not we're not so much thinking about what should happen along the way at, at you know first act second act third act we're, we're, it's all pure possibility when we think of the different possibilities of how the struggle of the power play can, can uh, work out to some conclusion. And remember, usually something has to get destroyed and something new is created and things never can stay the same. Whether you, whether you want them to or not, things die. Things change. Things are not as we hoped or expected. It's all, it's all part of life. I hope that was helpful. If this has given you any ideas, please leave a comment. If you like my videos and want to get me back, please hit the like button, subscribe, tell another artist friend. You can tweet this link, Google Plus this link. Uh, please take the time to go check out my uh, project at solomation.com called Terrible Immunity. I hope that you come up with a lot of great power relationship models and that they inform your creativity. I hope your writing goes well and have a good day.